So today is Monday, March 4th. Uh, this is the third day of our 2019 Jataka session here at the Toronto Zen Center. Uh, I'd like to open with a little uh, bit on practice, um, something that I've noticed uh, about a return to basics or about basics that I've noticed uh, sitting as I am uh, in this session facing out uh, and right by the entrance door uh, to the Zendo. So the practice of Zen is a practice of attention. Ultimately, this means becoming conscious to such a degree that we get clear on the very nature of our own self. Seeing through our habitual self-centeredness, we find renewed connection with all things, animate and inanimate. To help us in this, Zen offers small rituals, moments, or seconds of dropping self-involvement to become more fully present. One such uh, is the ritual of entering the Zendo, which includes re-entering the Zendo after Doksan. When we enter or re-enter the Zendo, except when doing so in a group, the ritual is to pause for an instant on the threshold and bow. We are re-entering the non-dual realm of Manjushri, Bodhisattva, of great Prajna wisdom, the very place where the work of practice realization has its home. So we take a second to honor and acknowledge this important connection. In so doing, we link ourselves not only to Manjushri, patron of all Zendos, but to all our Dharma ancestors, the countless men and women who came before us, going all the way back to the Buddha, whose own efforts and realization made our practice today possible. It is empowering, and it is an easy thing to forget, especially when coming back uh, out of Doksan. So, uh, of course, uh, like anything else, this little ritual bow can be overdone or conversely become a thoughtless formality. In essence, we don't need to make an overly deep bow full of emotion. Instead, whatever is going on in our heads or in our practice, we just simply pause at the threshold, hands in gasho, bend in a bow, straighten up, and step in. That's it. As simple as this is, is, it adds surprising depth to our practice and brings with it the added richness and power of a living tradition. Though I'm only a guest in your Zendo, out of respect for the serious and dedicated practice here, I pass this little bit along. So now, uh, as to our Teisho tonight and the Jataka, We'll look at a classic, a truly classic Jataka that at some point we've looked at before in one of the years that we've done this. Uh, there is a version of this Jataka in my book, Before Buddha Was Buddha, which came out in the spring from Wisdom Publications. But I've revised that talk as well as now including the full story, not simply a synopsis. And so the Jataka we'll look at is the Jataka of the Banyan Deer. Uh, this is the Nigrod Hamaga Jataka number 12 in the Pali collection of 547 such tales. And the story goes like this. <clears throat> Long ago, the Bodhisattva came to life as a banyan deer. In time, he was leader of his herd. Now, at that time, the human king of that realm loved to hunt. His people, forced to drive the animals to his bowmen and drive the wagons loaded with game back to the palace, were not happy. Given the king's demands, they had little time for their own real work of growing, harvesting, building, schooling, and such. So they gathered together and came up with a plan. They built a stockade in the forest, and they drove two herds of deer inside. The king won't need us, they said. Let him hunt to his heart's content. Now we can get back to our work and our lives. One of the captured herds was the herd of the Banyan deer, uh, the Buddha in a past life.
The king, the human king, came to the stockade, and at first he was taken aback, seeing the deer trapped there and realizing that he'd no longer be out there hunting. Then he understood his people did need to get on with things. In time, his own revenues would fail if the kingdom didn't prosper, so he agreed. Looking down from the platform at the top of the stockade at the two herds, he said, only my hunters need remain. You can all go. Then he added, those two deer king, the herd leaders, are magnificent animals. No one is to shoot them. So the people went home. The hunter shot a deer for the king's kitchen. And it all seemed well. But inside the stockade, it was not well. Not for the deer. There was confusion and terror every day. When the king and his huntsmen arrived, the stockade exploded into chaos, all the deer running in panic. Many of the trapped deer were injured. Some were stabbed by antlers or struck by hooves in desperate efforts to escape the hunter's arrows. Others were wounded, arrows sticking in their haunches or through their necks. Each day, when the archers drew their bows, all the deer began scrambling, scrambling for safety every which way. But there was no safety. And each day a deer was hauled off to the king's kitchen, while many others were lamed, gored, and wounded. One day the banyan deer, the bodhisattva, went to the leader of the other herd. Brother, I have searched and tried every exit. There is no escape. But for the sake of our herds, I have a plan that will at least lessen our people's sufferings. We'll hold a lottery. One day a deer from my herd and the next a deer from yours will be selected. Then that one deer alone will go and stand before the huntsman and only that one deer will be killed. It's a terrible solution. But no others will be injured. In this way, we can relieve at least some of our people's pain. And the other deer king agreed. The next day, the human king and his huntsmen found one trembling deer standing before their shooting platform. The human king was moved. Those deer king are wise. They have found a way to help their people, he said. We will honor their decision. From now on, we'll shoot only the one that stands before us. An arrow flew, and that one deer died, and no others were injured. After that, that's how it went. Each day, one deer died, and the rest were safe. The king missed the thrill of the hunt, but he had fresh meat. One day, a pregnant doe drew the short straw. She went to her king, leader of the other herd. The lottery has fallen on me, but I will soon give birth. When my fawn is old enough to live on its own, I will take my place before the huntsman. But if I do it now, both I and my unborn fawn will die. It is not right. The lottery claims only one life. Two should not die. Please spare my child. But her king, exempt himself from the terror of the huntsman's arrows, remained unmoved. The law is the law, he said. The lottery fell on you, so you must go. There are no exceptions. But the doe would not give up. She ran to the banyan deer. You are right, said the bodhisattva when he heard her plea. You can wait until your fawn is grown old enough to survive on its own. Be at peace, sister. Another shall take your place this day. The doe bounded joyously away. For a time she would live, and her child would survive for a time. The Banyan deer walked to the hunters. How could he ask another to take her place? He had freed her. Now he would take her place. The king and his hunters were shocked to see the Banyan deer standing below them. He had been freed from the hunt. The king said, Banyan deer king, why are you here? You know that you've been freed from my hunt. Send another. I have taken the place of a pregnant doe. The lottery fell on her, answered the bodhisattva. It is not right that two should die when the lottery demands only one. 
I freed her, so I've taken her place. This is my right and my duty as king. What? exclaimed the human king, amazed. You would give your life to save another? I would, great king. I shall. But you are king, and so the most important one. Let another deer take your place. The people should serve their king. No, a king serves his people, said the Banyan deer. Because I am king, it is always their welfare I have in mind. The king tugged at his beard and sta stared down at the Banyan deer. Then he spoke, Great Banyan deer, this is a noble lesson. A king must care for the least of his subjects. This, I admit, has not been my strength. In gratitude for your teaching, I shall now free both you and your herd. Take your people and leave. You and your herd are spared from my hunt. Go now, be free and at peace. The Banyan deer shook his head. O oh, king of men, how I wish I could, but I cannot. What of the other herd? If my herd and I leave, the other herd will suffer all the more. Your huntsmen's arrows will fall only on them. Their suffering shall increase terribly. And the doe with fawn is in that herd. She and her unborn fawn will not survive. No, said the Banyan deer, shaking his head. It would be pointless. How could I ever be at peace? knowing that my freedom had been bought at such a price. For me to be at peace, the other herd would also have to be freed. The human king was silent, and he said, You would risk your safety, and that of your herd for a deer and herd that are none of your own? I would, great king, said the Banyan deer. I will. This is a high teaching and a very great lesson indeed, admitted the human king. He sighed. But so it shall be. Go. Be happy now and live in peace. For this day I shall free the other herd as well. Neither herd will be hunted again. Go and be at peace. But the Banyan deer did not leave. Instead, he said, Great king, I myself have lived too long with danger to let it now fall recklessly on others. I know the terror of the hunt. All the other herds, indeed all the other animals of the forest, will now suffer terribly if both our herds are freed. All the others will be hunted without mercy. How then can I go and be at peace? What peace could I have? O oh, king, free them as well. If you really mean for me to be at peace, it is the only way. The king pondered. At last, he said, it seems that you are determined to make us farmers, not hunters. But I begin to understand. How could you walk away and be at peace knowing the sufferings that your freedom will bring to others? Your logic is impeccable. All the animals, too, I see, must be free if you are to be at peace. O oh, noble beast, now, because of you, the other animals are also free from my hunt. I have learned much, and the price of your wisdom is steep. But go now and be at peace, great being. But the Banyan deer did not move. He looked up at the trees and sky. Sire, I cannot, he said. Majesty, look, the birds that fly and sing and build their nests. From this day on, your hunters' slings, nets, and arrows will be aimed only at them. They will fall from the skies like rain. Their slaughter cannot be imagined. How could I abandon them to such a fate and be at peace? Great king, have mercy. 
free the birds too. The king bit his lip. He stood in silence. At last, he said, great being, you are merciless, but you are right. There is no peace unless it extends to all. So now I release the birds too from my hunt. Go and be at peace. Majesty, said the Banyan deer, in whom wisdom and generosity overflow. How can I go? Your nets, hooks, and spears will now be poised above the silvery, silvery swimmers, the fish. Great king, the fish. Are they not beautiful? Think of how they swim and leap, purifying your rivers, lakes, and streams. If I do not speak now, for those who are silent, who will? Let them live too, great king. Are vegetables tasty when eaten without meat, fowl, or fish, asked the human king? Are beans, grains, and fruit delicious? For such, it seems, must now be our food. You drive a hard bargain, great being. But I see your point. For you to be at peace, even the fish must be free. Now hear this, he announced, from this day forth, all beings in my realm are my own dear subjects. None are to be hunted or killed. All are protected. This is my lasting decree. Turning to the Banyan deer, he asked, Now, great one, are you at peace? The Banyan deer saw the deer grazing in the stockade. He saw and heard the birds singing and soaring, over, soaring overhead. Through spaces between the logs of the stockade, he glimpsed the forest animals going about their business. A tear fell from the deer king's eye. In it was reflected the entire world. Yes, great king, he said. Now I am at peace. And he leapt like a fawn for joy, sheer joy. He had saved them all. The gates opened, and the Banyan deer Bodhisattva led both herds from the stockade into the forest. Later, the human king had the pillar of a, a pillar of stone set on the spot where the Banyan deer had leaped. On it was carved the picture of a deer and the words, Homage to the Banyan deer, teacher of kings. So that's the, uh, the Jataka. Now let's take a look at it from the ground of practice. Uh, and we'll start with a quote from William Blake. The wild deer wandering here and there keeps the human soul from care. That's one of Blake's proverbs of hell, from the marriage of heaven and hell. So, we like to imagine that compassion is simply natural for a bodhisattva, like reaching back for a pillow in the night. And at a certain point, no doubt it is. But the consequences of having a heart of compassion can be dire. Think of the bodhisattvas who risked their lives to harbor Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. Can we fathom the depths of their integrity and their courage? In the story of the Buddhas seeing signs of impermanence and leaving home, you all know that story, I assume, seeing the sick man, the old man, the aging, dead man, sick man, old man, dead man, and then a home leaver, a wanderer, a truth seeker, uh, and he leaves home. And in this Jataka of the Banyan deer, the Buddha-to-be in both cases faces the first noble truth impermanence. Things don't last. Things will end. Life is short and difficult. Each time, rather than suppressing, fleeing, or trying to hide, he stands his ground, faces it straight on, and then takes one more vital step forward. As a Banyan deer, he does it in the boundary realm where human and animal natures meet. The bodhisattva deer works through attachment to his body and mind so quickly we might miss it. But surely there was an instant when, like a traveler at a crossroads, all is held up to an inner light and a decision must be made. 
Even for such an advanced bodhisattva, this had to have been a milestone, one that even he himself didn't know he was capable until he did it. And then he did it again and again. Still, it was never a given, not, oh yeah, he's a bodhisattva, of course he'll do it. The creative and liberating work of Zazen, of letting self-centeredness go, can seem like torment to our ingrained egotism. And so Zazen can at times be difficult. People may practice for a while and then back off or even leave. I've recommended to my students, so I'll pass it on here as well, working with a therapist if things are too unsettled or unsettling can be valuable. Even as dedicated Zen students, we shouldn't overlook getting help we need. We live, after all, in crazy times. And in the practice of Zen, our habitual conditioned belief in a solid, lasting, independent self forever, terribly separate from flowers, birds, stars, trees, mountains, clouds, bugs, people, even people we love, is going to be put to the test. Seeing through and releasing attachments to concepts of isolated selfhood is the work of practice realization, a direct and practical way to fulfill the bodhisattva vow to save the many beings. It is not a way of building a new Zen-enhanced ego, at least it shouldn't be, or it shouldn't remain only as that. There is one reason why not simply sitting, this is one reason why not simply sitting on one's own, but working with the teacher remains vital. We need to be checked by the eye of the tradition. Continuous Zen practice is the actualization of bodhisattva vows. How? Dogen writes in the Genjo Koan section of Shobo Genzo, Eye of the Treasury of the True Dharma, to study the way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things of the universe. To be enlightened by all things of the universe is to cast off the body and mind of the self as well as those of others. Even traces of enlightenment are extinguished and a life of traceless enlightenment goes on forever. To free others is to free ourselves. To free ourselves is the beginning of freeing others. The bodhisattva, as a deer, frees himself and he frees others. For him there's no separation. His insight into empty connectedness segues seamlessly into action. We too may discover that some insight into emptiness, rather than isolating us, actually opens the door to more complete and fulfilling participation in the world. Yet many people still think of Buddhism as some kind of passive, calm, maddeningly peaceful, always smiling, navel-gazing tradition. Or if they think of Zen Buddhism, they think of being in the zone, which translates to being beyond irritation and pain, at ease, unencumbered, sinking three-point baskets, running a marathon, painting a masterpiece, all without effort, sweat, or thought. True enough, there are such moments. But what of actual practice? What of years of exertion? What of aching knees, anxiety before doksan? the wrong paths taken for seemingly the best of reasons? What of failures and disappointments? What of difficult days surviving on no more than a sesame seed and lonely nights what can feel like pointless zazen? What of all the effort? They're there in our practice, and as the Jataka's the tales and legends of the Buddha's life show they were in his life and practice as well. Looking at the Jatakas, we don't see escapism or mere, or mere quietism. What we see is an ever-evolving, better maybe say ever-maturing practice of attention, the work of someone dropping self-absorption and acting out of that greater freedom with courage and compassion. Yet even for the Buddha, there were times when he stood at a difficult crossroad and hard decisions had to be made, 
We see that in the tigris jataka and in the blue bear too, that both of which we looked at this weekend. The banyan deer is another classic presentation of such a moment, offered a chance for personal freedom. The bodhisattva deer, a so-called lesser being, risks his life to save a pregnant doe in her unborn form. Then he moves forward, step by courageous step, facing down each temptation to split and run until he saved all the trapped deer, all the forest animals, all the birds, and even fish before finally accepting freedom for himself. This is mind-blowing, embodying the deepest vow mind of the bodhisattva the core of which is to free others before finally fully liberating oneself. But actually, the two go hand in hand. The core of Zen and of all Mahayana, literally great way Buddhist practice, is the vow to save all beings. It is the first of four vows or great vows for all. While we usually begin working on ourselves to become free of our own suffering, in time, like the Banyan deer, we come to see that we can't be truly free unless others are free as well. The converse is also true. Others can't be truly free unless we are. Once we catch a glimpse of the fact that we are not separate, something shifts. We too can't help start taking greater responsibility, doing small things, ones presently in our power that can help not just ourselves, but others. So begins the path of the bodhisattva, the maturing wisdom being or growing up being. A bodhisattva is a growing up being, a Buddha a fully grown up one. Zen teaches that saving fundamentally means helping release beings from the delusion of unenlightenment, the delusion arising from attachment to the concept of a personal self in here and countless others, the many beings, countless beings out there. Freeing or saving includes doing what we can to free others, human and non-human, from the sufferings that arise from dualistic thinking, social and political systems built on superiority and inferiority, inferiority, riches and poverty, mine versus yours, destruction of environments, denigration of women, abuse of children, starvation in the midst of plenty, melting ice caps, vanishing species, bombs, guns, explosives in fields where children play, walls topped with barbed wire and broken glass, fear, hunger, injustice, racism, chauvinism, the exhaustion of common resources, in short, the whole catastrophe that our addiction to egotism, an unconscious belief in a fixed, separate, permanent, and so savable self or soul gives rise to. But how do we release others from this delusion when so much of the time we can hardly free ourselves? Causing less harm to others by being less self-involved is the essence of the second bodhisattva vow. There are several ways of translating this. One is greed, anger, and ignorance rise endlessly. I vow to abandon them. Or endless blind passions I vow to uproot. This vow is about doing the actual work of liberation. By letting go of attachment to habitual self-centeredness, we make fewer uncalled-for judgments and place fewer burdens on others. In essence, we free them from the burdens we place on them with our projections and judgments, even as we free ourselves. We release those around us from our own sets of categories from the insistence that you be this thing, the tree be that thing over there, and that me, myself, and glorious I be the center of it all. 
being less caught up in ourselves, less bound by ourselves, we have more energy, space, and time to be fully present, and so of greater use to others. Being less here, we find that we are more here than ever. The sounds of chirping birds, wind in the trees, the clanging of heat pipes or morning traffic can be a symphony. The light on the snow in winter or on green leaves in summer can be unframed masterworks. And a conversation with a friend, transformative as a good novel. Well, this is what practice helps us get to. It begins by revealing how self-involved, how busy with self-centeredness we usually are. In Zen practice, we see this and we acknowledge and accept it. And we use this humbling awareness to go deeper, not by avoiding reality, but by transforming it through attention, attention, attention. Zen teachers aren't gurus. They are guides who can correct us when we step off the trail, nudge us back from precipices we may not see, and rob us of all we've clung to, the things we hold so dear they have brought us into our current messes. The Banyan deer appears in two versions in the Pali Jataka of collection of 547 tales. While the differences are minor, the core of each is that the dear Bodhisattva offers his own life to save a doe, an unborn fawn, and then goes on to save all the other animals. In both versions, compassion wins out over a habitual impulse to save the self and ignore the well-being of others. In each tale, we see the central practice heart's desire, the vow, to save all beings brought fully alive. Mahayana Buddhism holds that this compassionate vow is true for all beings, whether they even consciously know it or not. It is true because it is the nature of mind to have or be such a vow. In the tale, because of the Bodhisattva deer's selfless efforts, not just a doe and its fawn, but everyone is freed. Even the king and his huntsmen stop creating the future bad karma that they will be causing themselves by hurting and killing. Because of the Banyan deer's vow, a human being with power in the social order for the first time hears the teaching of the non-human and responds. And what does non-human nature want? According to this Jataka, simply to live its own life in its own habitat, following its own life path. 2,500 years after this tale was first told and this point made, the possibilities for fulfilling this eminently reasonable request have only gotten considerably worse. Economic pressures and population densities are turning green forests into killing stockades. Given this, the Banyan deer Jataka can speak and function as perhaps never before. It's teaching that no one can be free and at peace unless all are makes absolute sense in our more and more visibly interconnected world. A reactor melts in Japan and San Francisco and Portland may have reason to worry. A bomb explodes in Tehran and horrifying details appear on our phones. One implication of Dogyo's, uh, Do, sorry, Dogen's Gabyo, uh, the chapter in Shobogenzo, which is uh, titled Painting of a Rice Cake, Gabyo, a fascinating section of the Shobogenzo, Eye of the Treasury of the True Dharma, is that dreams, stories, art, books, movies, wooden, metal, clay, and painted Buddhas, thoughts and vows are food. Dogen writes, only painted cakes satisfy hunger. 
turning that old adage, painted cakes can't satisfy hunger, on its head. And he playfully adds, without painted hunger, we never become true people. For Dogen, Jataka tales are Buddha, painting a picture of Buddha with the brush and ink of, to quote Dogen, countless kalpas of assiduous practice. If you want to paint a picture of Buddha, the only way to do it is by undergoing, committing yourself, and continuing with countless kalpas of assiduous, that is dedicated, determined, persevering practice with the determination to continue practicing whatever comes. This sustained exertion, so well dramatized by the Jatakas, is the nourishment offered by the Banyan deer, the teaching of interconnection, backed by the force of his whole being, is the real food, a meal that the king found quite a bit more transformative than mere venison. Responsibilities begin where the imagination has been touched. Yeats wrote, in dreams begin responsibilities. After encountering the Banyan deer, we too, like the king, may hopefully never be the same. A question remains. The Banyan deer saves all beings in that kingdom, but can he really save all beings? What of beings in other kingdoms? Oscar Schindler, the real-life hero of Schindler's List, a totally unexpected, even to himself, bodhisattva, <laughs> collapsed when the war was over, tormented by the fact that while he had saved many lives, he could not save more, could not, in fact, save all. All. Can such a vow be accomplished? The Bodhisattva of Alakitashvara really tried. You know that story? He saw the hells filled with suffering beings. He vowed to liberate them all, like we vow. The first of the four great vows. Ah, so... Having vowed to liberate them all, he labored for ages, descending into hell after hell, emptying hell after hell. At last, the Bodhisattva wiped the diamonds of sweat from his brow. The hells were empty, and they were silent. He smiled. It was done. Suddenly, there came a wailing scream, then another. Flames leapt, smoke whirled, blood-filled cauldrons bubbled madly, whips cracked, chains clanged, demons roared. The radiant smile faded from the Bodhisattva's face. In less than an instant, all was exactly as before. The hells were again completely filled. The Bodhisattva's head broke into eleven heads. His arms shattered into a thousand arms. With his eleven heads, he could now look in every direction to see the sufferings of every being. With one thousand arms, he could now reach into any realm to save those in need. Rolling up his one thousand sleeves, the Bodhisattva got back to work. Uh, that is adapted from the legend of Avalokiteshvara in my own book, The Hungry Tigress, Yellow Moon Press, 1999. Zen master Wu Men, Mumon in Japanese, says in another context in The Gateless Barrier, a collection of koans and commentaries and verses, the failure is wonderful indeed. From this wholehearted effort and total failure came even greater commitment, greater effort, and greater skill. Wonderful indeed. No matter how hard we work, no matter how long we sit with legs crossed and minds focused, there will be failures, difficulties, errors, and disappointments. 
If we think that practicing Zen or even attaining a degree of enlightenment will make all rough roads smooth, drive all dark clouds away, and turn our lives into a proverbial bed of roses, we'd better think again. We are going to find ourselves disillusioned and disappointed by our own naivete. The Dalai Lama has the sorrows of the Chinese invasion and brutal occupation. The Buddha had his jealous psychopathic cousin, David Dada. The Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara makes a great and total effort, but in the end, his immensely heroic failure only gives rise to even greater, more committed and skillful practice. We evolve, we mature through our efforts, all partial, none complete, in so, in one sense, all failures. And that's the way. Power for the way, the old teachers say, doesn't come from staying safely in the calm, peaceful place we might be able to get to or like to get to in our zazen. It comes from sitting, yes, but after that, it comes from standing up and going back into the ordinary mix of life and dealing with whatever is on our plate from a ground of awareness and compassion. Returning to the zendo, the dokes online, the workplace, the kitchen, desk, classroom, supermarket, ball field, library, campsite, body and mind disappear into a life of a thousand arms and eleven heads. Buddhism holds that throughout the universe countless Buddhas have already come and gone with at least seven past Buddhas on this earth and more to come. And yet, and yet, as the poet Isa's poignant haiku written after his young daughter's death reminds us, the whole haiku goes, this world of dew is just a world of dew. And yet, and yet, and yet terribly, sadly, terribly through all, though, though all these perfectly enlightened Buddhas have come and gone, perfectly fulfilling their vows to save all beings, clearly numberless beings remain just as lost and as in as much pain as ever. The hells are still full, the cauldrons of blood furiously boiling. Can this great vow to save all beings, have actual literal meaning? Can it have literal fulfillment? Or is it doomed to remain the expression of an impossible desire or hope? Is it a pointer towards something we wish for but can never accomplish? Well, lofty goals can help us see how far we are from where we want to be. Vows can keep our eyes on the prize, our feet on the path. Walking in the woods at night, a far-off light shining through the trees can show us where we need to go. In his 80th year of life, the English sculptor Henry Moore was asked, now that you are 80, you must know the secret of life. What is it? Moore paused. The secret of life, he mused is to have a task, something you do your entire life, something you bring everything to, every minute of the day for your whole life. And the most important thing is, it must be something you cannot possibly do. Once two herds of deer were trapped and marked for death. One deer said no to that, risking his own safety and that of his herd. He didn't do it to make a point. He did it because he saw that there was no way he could be free and at peace unless all beings were free. Animal though he was, he had already realized what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. He had the perception, not owned by any one tradition or even by any one species, 
of how things really are. All beings, one body. And he did not turn from it. That's what's overwhelming about the story. The Banyan deer is not simply a tale of heroic compassion. It is a tale of non-dual prajna wisdom, the ancient bodhisattva wisdom path, and the path of daily practice, right livelihood, personal integrity, and social justice are, it turns out, one and the same. We'll stop here and recite our great vows.